I am Jim Collison and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's Theme Thursday, Season 3, recorded on September 28th, 2017. Theme Thursday is a Gallup webcast series that dives deep into the Clifton Strengths themes, one theme at a time, and today's theme is futuristic. If you have questions, comments, or contributions during this webcast, we do have a live chat room that's available for you right below the main video window. If you just peek down there, if you're listening on our live page, there's a chat room down there. Yeah, you can log in. doesn't require an account. Bottom left-hand corner, it says log in. Click that. Choose the guest account. Put your name in where it says guest. Take those numbers out and then hit submit. We will take your questions live during the the program. If you're listening to the recorded version or have questions about custom strengths coaching solutions for small, medium, or large organizations, you can contact us as well. Send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to visit the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com for all your Clifton Strengths coaching resources and training needs. You can also catch the video and now downloadable audio and video. We call that podcasting. You can get this available on your iPhone or Android phone. Really easy to get, even offline. You can listen on the car, in a train, on a plane. Best way to recoup that time that you're traveling, all available for you. The directions and all the buttons and everything you need is available on our resources page at the Coach's blog. If you really remember one link, remember this one, coaching.gallop.com. Micah Librant is our host today. Micah works as a workplace consultant, but she's also in charge of the blog, by the way. The, and we are setting some records right now, which we're really super excited about. But Micah, welcome to another Theme Thursday. Thanks, Jim. Great to be here. Good to have you. We are talking futuristic today. And in pre-show, we both admitted this might be a little bit out of our wheelhouse. We brought Travis to talk about it, but we have a companion guide and we like to talk a little bit about it from the Gallup side before we bring Travis in. But, but Micah, what do you have to say about Futuristic? Futuristic, one of my favorites. Um, it is, it's sort of a supporting theme for me, not a dominant one, but a fantastic uh, strategic thinking theme. If you're following along on that companion guide, just a, a little uh, expectation or brief preview for you. What I will do is I will give us a quick overview of just isolating that theme and talking about it as it relates to leadership. That's your front page. The back page is really for you to guide the way that you listen to Travis, who's going to be a fantastic guest to really bring that uh, futuristic theme to life. Let's dive right into it. What this theme is about is not just imagining the future, but really truly seeing it. I, I find that it's one of those themes that a lot of people like to claim having futuristic tendencies, whether or not they really do. But if you're someone who truly leads with futuristic, the future is a real place for you. Uh, similar to if you're somebody who leads with context, the past is a real place. The timelines really line up. And I love spending time with futuristic leaders because you'll get to see this come to life. If you pick out some of the pieces of that long definition on the top of the companion guide, um, you'll you'll notice this in, in greater detail. Things like you're someone who loves to peer over the horizon. You see in detail what the future might hold. While the exact content of the picture is going to depend on your interests, your values, your other themes as well. Um, maybe it's about a better product, a better team. Maybe it's about a better world. Um, it will always be a place that you can go to for inspiration. Um, and I think about that as, as it feeding you as an individual contributor. It's, are you feeling down? Are you feeling lethargic? Are you feeling even unhealthy? Chances are you're not spending enough time feeding that desire to really truly imagine the future. It is a, um, it's almost like a regenerating resource for you to spend some time in the future. The great thing about it when you think about it as a leader is it's also inspirational to others. People look to you to describe your visions of the future. You might have even experienced people just saying, hey, what do you think about this? And you might realize what they're hoping for is a little bit of the taste of what can you see coming? What's over the horizon? What's what's uh, what's this going to become? Uh, so get better at it. And one of the, the pieces I love even about this long theme definition is it starts to give you some coaching advice. Practice. Choose your words carefully. How can you make that picture as vivid as possible because people do truly want to latch on to the hope that you bring? To define futuristic in a nutshell, it, it is really about um, focusing on the choices you make today based on what they're going to become tomorrow. But your vision of tomorrow and your definition of tomorrow stretches a little bit further than most people's. Um, so within that, um, that domain, I just want to take it a little bit further and think about how might it present itself in leaders. 
If you're an individual contributor with Futuristic, you're probably great at forecasting. You're probably great at sort of anticipating and thinking about what's coming. But if you're a leader with Futuristic, I think what you can do is you can be better not just at forecasting, but at bridge building. So not just here's what might be, but here's where we might go, or here's who we might be. Uh, it's that ability of futuristic leaders, not just to dream about the future, but to include the cast in the plot that you're writing for the future. Thinking about what's the setting going to be. Um, and a lot of that sounds like storytelling, and I think that's on purpose, because one of the muscles you should start to flex if you're a leader with futuristic is that one that says, how do I get this vision out of my head and into the hearts and minds of others? Uh, because it is a strategic thinking theme. It's it's not an influencing theme. And sometimes that can be how do you stretch it? How do you improve upon futuristic? Is how do you how do you really plant those seeds that you can see so vividly in ways that um, that really speak to other people? Futuristic as a theme might stretch others beyond where they normally would stretch. And if you've ever taken a yoga class or like me, gone the um, more affordable work from home route and downloaded a yoga app, you will have heard an instructor say, don't push your body beyond where it should go or don't stretch physically to, to beyond where it hurts. This should feel good, but it shouldn't hurt. And sometimes that stretch element can hurt people. Uh, I think when you're making people uncomfortable or you're stretching them beyond where they're where they're used to, um, there can be an element of fear. There can be an element of discomfort. Um, consider this a gift. Consider this something that you can give. When people are clinging to current situations that are less than ideal, sometimes they're clinging to them because it's where they find comfort. People will cling to disappointment. They will cling to pain. They will cling to um, negativity because it's recognizable. Um, how many times do you hear somebody say, gosh, how are you doing? And they respond with, I'm sad or I'm tired or I'm stressed. Um, somebody with futuristic can stretch that perception into, but where are we going? How are you going to feel tomorrow? What are we doing about that today to create a place where we're, we're in maybe a place of the unknown? Sometimes something better is something unknown. And that can be a fantastic gift that you can you can be sort of a servant leader and, and offer folks. You can make a positive future more clear. Involve the senses. Uh, in season one, Rosie Liesfeld talks about um, thinking about coaching leaders with futuristic and asking them, what does it smell like? What's it taste like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like. The mission, I think, is how do you make it more real for others? Because for you, it is. The future is real. If you're somebody who has high futuristic, it's not just a dream of, of where we can go. It's a very true understanding, an almost tangible understanding of, of where we're headed. Um, the ability to connect, I think, also cause and effect is a great one to think about for leaders. The ability to connect what's the next action we're going to take with what's the long-term effect that's going to have. That can make you a different kind of strategist. So, you might have futuristic, but not strategic. And that might throw you off and think, but but I'm so strategic in the way, you know, that we use it in, in our common vocabulary. What's beautiful and critical and thoughtful about futuristic is you see that sort of cause and effect relationship in different ways than maybe somebody with a strategic thinking theme would. Um, and I think about leveraging that as, as, a, as something that you could bring to the table in critical decision-making conversations. How often do you as a leader find yourself at that that blueprint table where you're really drawing out plans for the future. Think about honing or fine tuning the questions that you ask others to really help them stretch their, their understanding of what do we need to do today into where is this going to bring us or how is this going to bring us to where we want to be. Based on the other themes that you have, your futuristic is going to look very different. So don't forget to take into account theme dynamics and the other themes that are there. But maybe maybe here's an exercise you could consider. Take into account the other themes that are there to answer the question, when and how does your best forecasting happen? 
If, for example, you're somebody with high relator and futuristic, it might happen in the context of, of seeing the best future for the people who you love. If you're somebody with discipline and futuristic, it might happen by imagining future systems that are really going to help you get the job done. If you're somebody with, say, input and futuristic, it, you might do great forecasting when you include external ideas of where we're going. Those are just three examples across those four domains that are going to change the direction, the inflection and the color of your futuristic. So really get to know it. Uh, really get to know um, by studying past success of when you do your best. And that way, you can you can make time travel a habit. Um, you can consider how you get your best vision out of your mind and, and transform it into inspiration and leadership for other people. The last thing I want to talk about is those four needs of followers. Uh, at Gallup, we found that great leaders don't necessarily have the same themes. Um, they don't necessarily have the same theme domains. That's what this whole season is about, but they do know themselves and they think about leveraging the themes that they do have in order to satisfy the four needs of followers. Uh, first is trust. A leader with futuristic could build trust by sharing what it is that you see. You spend a lot of time in a different headspace than other people. Um, be bold enough to describe perhaps your own future. Be bold enough to describe what you're seeing when you're doing some of that time traveling into the future. Um, and maybe even think about uh, how, how you include people who you see in the future. Those people that you lead, uh, talk about where you see them going forward. And I think that builds uh, a real trust, not just of you as a leader, but also a trust of your talent. A leader with futuristic might build compassion by considering the individual futures of those people who you lead. Ask them what their dreams are. Um, talk to them in, uh, about where they're going. I have a great leader in my life with, with high futuristic, and she's always almost seemingly more interested in what my future dreams are even than I am. I lead with more of a, the adaptability side of things where I'm real pumped about where we are today. Um, and the kind of stretching, and I'm always impressed by how excited she gets when I talk about what's what, what I see for three or five years um, into the future. That's a brilliant display of compassion, that excitement for the future of other people. Um, challenge yourself to know the dreams of the people on your team, even if they don't seem quite as clear, because they won't if they don't have futuristic. They won't have that same sort of vividness that that perhaps you can see you can build upon that you can show that you care and that you love through through displaying compassion by by sort of time traveling with people uh, a leader with futuristic can build stability by considering that forward reaching timeline now, if you're somebody with high futuristic, you probably understand a, in a very real, very almost uh, logical way what is in the future. And it might be, uh, I think, focus on where where do you see the clearest? Is it six months down the road? Is it five or 10 years down the road? Is it millennia into the future? Um, get comfortable with where it's it's most clear for you. And then personalize that to the people on your team. Uh, where Where is the future most tangible for them? Um, and I use tangible in, in a figurative way, which is almost awful considering I've got an English degree. But where does the future make the most sense for them? Where is their motivation point? You might have people who need to be pushed based on what's happening next week or next quarter. Spend time there with them. You might have other people on your team who need to be pushed based on what's happening um, in the next season or, or in the next decade. Allow yourself the flexibility to bring your futuristic into an individualized place with folks um, and go there constantly with them. So be consistent about where on that timeline you dream with folks. That's going to be predictable about you. That's going to create some stability. And finally, I love to talk about hope. Futuristic almost seems like it was tailor-made for creating hope. And I'll ask Travis about this in, in his own leadership. But it, I think it's important to realize futuristic is not the same theme as positivity. Positivity is about seeing the glasses half full. It's about building um, sort of a, a cheerleadership or a, a base of rapport. It's about um, affecting the way that other people feel in a positive light. You can be futuristic and be um, very pragmatic and very uh, black and white about what's going on. You might describe a future that includes some hard times. You might think about, gosh, the near future and the far future and 
it's either one of those might include things that people don't want to hear. Uh, but I think you can create hope by talking through those difficult times, talking through what's tough, and talking about what they lead us to and how they lead us to better times. Now, this is important because it's the definition of hope. So you're going to have to, uh, I think, realize that it won't naturally make you positive, but being hopeful means that we believe tomorrow is going to be better than today and that we have the ability to, to make it so. So using futuristic toward hope means having a positive slant to it. It means being able to find what's going to be improved upon based on traveling into the future. It might also mean that you flex your communication muscles about helping people see the benefit of change, helping people see that when, when things are different, because they inevitably will be, that it will be better. Um, so there's lots of, of great muscles you can flex, lots of great investment you can make into your futuristic if you're somebody who leads with that. And at that point, I want to bring in a fantastic guest. Travis Goosey is uh, joining us from Williamsburg, Virginia today, actually just about an hour up the road from where I currently am. Travis, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be here with you. Hey, Travis, just to kickstart us, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and, and who you really are as a leader? Sure. Um, as a leader, I wear a couple different hats. Uh, one of the hats that I wear is uh, my title is uh, I'm a mission engagement facilitator uh, with the southeastern district of our church body. Uh, so I kind of have the responsibility of working with pastors and uh, church workers and uh, congregations uh, throughout Virginia. And I have one circuit kind of southeast of Washington, D.C. that I work with as well, a grouping of congregations. And my role is, I, I kind of say it's kind of like a, an irritant in an oyster to produce pearls. And what I mean by that is sometimes churches get a little comfortable inside the shells of their churches and they're all about, we love God, we love each other. And sometimes they forget there's a community that they're called to be a blessing to as well. And so my role is to come hopefully in a positive way, uh, maybe uh, disrupt the status quo just a little bit to get them thinking beyond as well. And doing that in a way that uh, kind of establishes some hopes and dreams for their community. So uh, I come along and I, I kind of say my role is to inspire, equip, resource and empower everyday believers in churches to connect with their neighbors, to be a blessing, to serve and love them uh, in order to uh, connect them to God and to Jesus. So that's one of the roles I, I have. And then the other role is I also have a, a personal coaching practice. Um, I'm right now uh, right in the middle of rebranding that. Uh, we're moving uh, to uh, a vision called Strength Solutions, which is about empowering everyday individuals and organizations to be their best uh, through strengths-based solutions. And uh, I've been on a journey uh, as a coach for, I think it's been about 10 years now. Uh, started uh, with the College of Executive Coaching. I'm an ICF certified life and executive coach. And actually uh, was introduced to coaching through StrengthsFinder uh, when I was uh, in the Los Angeles area and very early on was uh, trained uh, as a strengths coach through the uh, the, the uh, uh, former strengths division or a uh, faith division, I apologize, uh, the Gallup used to have and then recertified about three years ago as a certified Gallup strengths coach. Fantastic. Gosh, I already hear this just dripping with futuristic. Yes. <laughs> how, do, how do you see futuristic at play in the work that you do? Well, um, I would say, first of all, on the ministry side, um, there's a lot of congregations that I work with who, especially now, uh, times have changed. Uh, we are no longer where we used to be 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, with ministry uh, in a North American context. And there's a lot of churches that find that a lot of what used to work doesn't work anymore. Uh, a lot of ministries are aging, they're starting to shrink, and there, there's a lot of fear uh, that, 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 ex that, ex that exists in that. And I think that where my futuristic really comes in is to inspire hope that there can be a different future. Uh, and so a lot of the work I come along with, for example, I use a lot of appreciative inquiry uh, in working with uh, congregations. Uh, that's actually been one of the, the main ways that I've been connecting and, and serving and blessing churches over this last year since I've started my new role here. And uh, what we call it is Envision. And what Appreciative Inquire really is, is first of all about sharing uh, the best of what's happened uh, in this ministry, sharing those success stories of how God has been working in and through the lives of people, uh, and then uh, participants interviewing one another to be able to celebrate and find that positive core. But then we start moving to the hopes and dreams, not, not hopes and dreams disconnected from who they are, 
but hopes and dreams in which the best of who they are begin to be lived out and imagined in new ways. And so in coaching, we kind of call that skimming for vision. It's recognizing that uh, the vision is not just in their pastor, but there's also a vision that exists in the hearts and the minds of the members of that church. And so what we want to do is try to add that. Uh, I, I always think of vision kind of like a, an artist. Um, I have a, a phenomenal artist friend of mine. Uh, he sells paintings for fifty or $60,000. He's actually learned the success of making money while he's alive. Wow. And what's amazing <laughs> is uh, as an artist, what he does is he takes three primary colors. And it's amazing the mixture of those three colors to then paint these amazing works of art that that he creates. And vision is a lot like that too, is, is the idea of there's the vision, the primary color of your pastor that either is there or they're going to call. But then there's the color of the vision that, that God has laid on the hearts of people within that ministry. And then that third, which we try to bring into that uh, in, uh, appreciative inquiry process is then What's the vision in the community? What what are the hopes and the dreams, the the hurts and the fears of, of the community that then you can be an answer to? And then it's seeing what uh, God does of creating this beautiful piece of art through that. And 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 uh, what, what's amazing is at the end of these, uh, the the strategic opportunities, a positive future is envisioned, and uh, it creates a lot of inspiration and hope uh, for the ministries that I work with. I'm hearing some blending as well here with your other themes. Uh, could you tell us your top five? Sure. Uh, number one is includer. Uh, so I love to include people into visions of the future. Uh, my number two is ideation. Number three is strategic. Number four is connectedness. And then number five is futuristic. Uh, so there is a, a very strong interplay, especially for me, that, that ideation, uh, my uh, strategic and my futuristic. So I always say that it's like blowing up idea bubbles of the future and then developing strategies to, to make that happen. So in the intro, I thought about this idea of, you know, knowing based on your other themes, when is your futuristic at its really at its best? Um, it, looking at your other themes or looking at past successes that you've had, when do you do your best futuristic work? I think when it's the opportunity where we can brainstorm, where we can say, let's try to imagine a different path. Let's try to imagine a different future that that can be, whether it's for an individual that I'm coaching, for a team, or with a, a ministry or a organization. And that there's, there's permission given to say, it's okay to dream. Uh, and, and that's, I think, where I come in as my best. I always say if I could be a, a part of a, a futuristic strategic think tank and drink coffee all day, that'd be like my ideal environment. So... That's awesome. How do you recreate that sort of think tank environment or, or how do, what does it look like for you? How do you personalize that? Well, personally, um, usually it's finding times to get away. Uh, I, I really need to disconnect, I think, from the everyday grind uh, that uh, you experience uh, with with work and with family and ministry. And and so for me on a personal level, I, I try to find someplace inspiring. Uh, I, I just moved here about a year ago from uh, uh, being uh, in Idaho. I lived about an hour and a half away from Yellowstone and the Tetons. And, and for me, that was kind of where I went to find inspiration for my mm -hmm. futuristic is disconnecting, being up in the mountains, someplace inspiring, and just allowing uh, time to daydream. And, and I think that you know, many times in the past, people might think, oh, you know, head in the cloud daydream. Actually, for a futuristic uh, leader, uh, being able to have that time to daydream is necessary. And that's the fuel that really allows that futuristic theme to kind of really stretch its legs and run. What happens after you've had that time? Well, from that time, excitement energy. Uh, usually then it's uh, my, my other talent themes go to work of, of the ideation of, okay, now what are ideas to make this happen. It's uh, developing strategies. And usually with that, especially when I'm working with others, it's now including them into that, that, that I kind of begin to put some of the colors on the palette, but as an includer and with my connectedness, I don't like to just paint that by myself is I want others to get their hands in and, and let's co-create this together. So it's not just about my vision, but it's about our vision together. Almost sounds like after you've had time to really think and ideate and, and, and forecast that you're better prepared to, to bring others into the picture. I think so. Yes, very much so. Great. So Travis, what's your take on futuristic as it relates to leadership? How does that affect the kind of leader that you are? You know, I think um, 
there are times in which you need somebody who can, as you said, kind of peer over the hedge, um, who can be on that mountain and look at the horizon of where we're going. Um, I, I think that a lot of times uh, somebody with futuristic is really kind of like a pioneer. Uh, they're, they're somebody who sets out like in the early days of the Oregon Trail. And uh, if, if you don't have those people going out first, doing that exploring and looking of what can be, the others, the settlers, don't have a chance to come along behind. Uh, now, now, as a pioneer, as a futuristic, you got to make sure that you don't get too far ahead of the settlers or they get a little scared. Um, but, but to make sure that you can go out, come back and say, hey, this is what could be. And then hopefully uh, inspiring that, uh, that hope and that vision where they'll join you on that uh, vision as well or on that journey. Have you ever had the experience where you got too far ahead or where you lost people? Yes. Uh, very early on uh, in my ministry, uh, I definitely was way out in front of people. Uh, and especially when I, I don't think I had an understanding of Strengths Finder. Um, I, I, like one situation I remember, I had a, an elder who had context. And uh, it, it wasn't until later on when I started um, having my leaders take uh, Strengths Finder so we could kind of understand and appreciate uh, the best of who we are. I used to see him as just somebody who was constantly shooting down uh, my visions and my ideas. And, and what I realized is he had a value of the past um, and the history, and especially for ministry, uh, this is really important uh, that, that I've had to learn to appreciate and value is um, a longer a church has been around or the longer a church body has been around, the more that history is something that's ingrained in their identity. It's very important. Uh, my church body, we're actually just celebrating uh, Lutheran Church uh, 500 years since the Reformation and Martin Luther. Uh, so we are steeped in history and tradition, and there's a lot of celebration of that history happening right now. Um, but yet, you know, as a leader, um, you, you realize that looking at the past is great, being in today is important too, but we also have to anticipate what's coming and what can be uh, because while we can celebrate the past, the past is not always going to define who we are in the future because circumstances keep changing, communities keep changing, uh, the culture keeps changing, and we have to make sure that, that we are looking over that hedge so we can anticipate uh, what those changes are. Um, I, I always kind of think of it as, as um, I used to live in Southern California and I used to see people surfing all the time. And uh, one of the things that uh, with, with surfing is as those waves, you have to be able to not just see them, but anticipate enough so that you can catch those waves. Because if you don't, you lose that opportunity and you have to wait for another one or they come crashing on you. But if you can watch and anticipate those waves that come, you can catch those and have a wonderful ride. And I think that that's the same way with futuristic is it's like looking out of the horizon of the ocean and looking at the, the changes coming in your community and your culture and helping position yourself so that those don't crash upon you, but how to catch those for being that blessing that you intend to be for your community. So you mentioned maybe that the frustration came from not totally understanding Strengths Finder. Um, what is it that you understand now that has made a partnership with other people who have different themes easier? I think it's it's appreciating that it's not differences, but it's complementary that we need each other. Um, probably the the greatest place I saw this was in my marriage with my wife. Um, uh, my wife, um, she she actually my top or her bottom, and my bottom or her top. Uh, and for a long time, I used to say that I blew up these idea bubbles of the future, and she would come along with a pin to pop them. <laughs> What I've learned is her analytical, her deliberative, her discipline, or her harmony, there, she's, she's not trying to pop my balloon, but she's trying to test them and refine them and make them better. Or maybe uh, a, a little different uh, play on that analogy is my balloons tend to take me away and she keeps my feet on the ground so I don't get carried away. So, um, and, and so what I've seen with that is it's made our marriage way stronger is um, we see how it's complementary to each other and we're better together than we can be by ourselves. And, and that plays out in any relationship, uh, whether it's uh, with a coworker, with a team, or with uh, other leaders that uh, you're coaching. That's fantastic. I like this idea of, of partnership here and what a, I can't imagine a better sort of experiment in partnership than actually sharing your life with someone else. Yes. Um, 
How, what do you do on purpose now, now that you see these themes not as different, but as complementary? Um, how do you work with, say, somebody with context or somebody um, with vastly different expectations? Are there, are there tips or tricks or practices that has made that easier? I, I think that the, the key, and, and I think this comes out a lot in my coaching that I do, is to celebrate that there's no wrong talents, uh, but but that every talent we have are unique to who we are, and it's what makes us who we are. It's the best that we can offer. Uh, it's the best contribution we can make. But but to realize that that in any part of life, I, I've really a long time ago really have said that life is ultimately all about relationships. It's our relationship with ourself. It's our relationship with others, whether it's the workplace or our family. It's the relationship to the challenges as well as the opportunities of life. And obviously being a person of faith, believing uh, it's the relationship we have with God. But but it's it's recognizing that it's not just your talents that you have as wonderful as is. It's not just for the life you create, but how there's this interrelationship and this interplay of other people with the talents that they have and that we need each other. I, I think it was um, a couple years ago, uh, I, I really walked away with a, a concept from uh, Gallup that, that really has stuck with me. And, and uh, whether it's retreats that I'm leading or coaching that I'm doing, is this idea that a strength isn't a strength until it's uh, complementary with somebody else who has those complementary strengths to your own. And, and so it's the idea that somebody else makes up for what you're lacking. And so you bring the best of who you are, but you also need others to round you out and that, again, you're better together than you can be by yourself. Uh, it sounds like it's it's just take it beyond the themes, right? Yes. Think about what's the value, what's the goal. Um, and, and what's and your, the what's your part that you play in that? Your part that you play. Oh, I love that. So I'm curious, Travis, you've got this, this pastor role where your futuristic really has to affect large groups of people. And you've also got coaching, which in many cases is, is really that one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. Does futuristic look different when you're trying to communicate a vision to groups of people than it does on an individual basis? I actually, I would say that uh, many of the similar things that I do uh, with groups work in coaching. Um, again, and, and this is probably something that for me has been a change in my leadership over the years. Um, I used to think that it was just about my vision and especially working with, with groups of people. Um, that uh, kind of to use a biblical analogy, um, I think a lot of pastors feel like they have to be Moses coming off the mountain with this vision and then you say, follow me. And it's this sales job to try to get people to buy into your vision and to realize that, that wait a second, there's also vision that's in the hearts of people. There are hopes and dreams that they have as well, as well as getting out in your community and listening. And I think that's one thing that coaching has brought to my leadership when I was a, a pastor in the congregation. And I definitely see it play out in a lot of the work that I do with pastors and congregations now in my role is to realize, yes, you you have a part to add to that vision, kind of like that painting and that color, but but the importance of making sure that you bring that other vision as well. I think when I work one-on-one -on -one with a, a coach, it, it's definitely much more applied to, all right, um, you're, you're here for coaching for a reason. It's it's either something that's not working in your life or there there's some aspiration or hope or, or a goal that you're looking for that you want to step into. And so then it's helping sit down with that person and try to clarify, first of all, where are we going in the coaching relationship? But then I think where my futuristic really comes into play is it helping them to envision a preferred future for their life, for their family, for their work setting. And then once we start painting what that picture is with, with words and images, then to develop strategies. What are the different options to see that vision become a reality? It's kind of this idea of managing from the future. So once we envision the future, then kind of like stepping stones back, what is it that we need to do or that you need to do as a client to get from where you are to where you want to be? So how do you, gosh, with futuristic, I imagine it's easier sometimes for you than the client to even envision that future. How do you make sure that they're creating it with you and you're not just telling them what you see. And, and that's where the, I think the, the importance of that coaching principle of ask, don't tell really comes into play. Uh, I think that's one thing that really as an ICF coach is really ingrained in a lot of the, the training that we go through is the client is the expert of their life. 
And so you have to really honor the client. I mean, there are times that I have very quickly seen, oh, this is what you should do. This mm -hmm. is where you should go. But to hold that resistance, because it's not going to be as impactful and powerful for them, if I tell them, it's going to be much more powerful if through listening and asking questions and, and kind of working through the coaching process that they come to that conclusion. And sometimes where they get to is not where I thought they would be. Other times there have been moments in which they zeroed in on exactly what I was thinking. Uh, it took a long, lot longer, but it was more empowering for them. They owned it and that energized them to take responsibility for it. Uh, so I think that when somebody just tells you what you should do, you can say, yeah, yeah. And then if it goes wrong, then uh, you're to blame. And especially as a leader, but I think the great thing with coaching is when you empower people and it makes sense for them and they take that ownership, they're really energized by that. And, and uh, that propels them into that future. Travis, we have a couple activator futuristic out there in the chat room. And while that's maybe not you, you've been in ministry and needed to have some situations where you've had to move people quickly. Yes. Any, what, in your, with your leadership experience and kind of thinking and knowing that activators might want to go, but you need to give people time, any advice you'd give in that scenario of, hey, we guys, beyond a fire drill, right? You could do that. You can scream fire in a, in a crowded room. But beyond doing that, advice you'd give for those activators who want to still move people into the future? Well, that's a great question. Um, I have a son who's an activator, um, and he gets frustrated just sitting around and talking. He just wants to go do. And that's great. But where I would really say, and I, I work with him a lot, um, we, we've been coaching him for the last uh, three or four years that he took his strengths finder, um, is you also got to know where you're going. Um, so, so it's easy to activate, but if you don't have that goal of where you're going, uh, it, sometimes it can be a lot of energy that, that doesn't get you to where you really need to be either individually or as an organization. So I think, again, it's recognizing that you bring an important part as an activator, um, but what somebody like myself does, uh, helping whether it's an individual or group figure out that preferred future, that's important so that you know where to direct that energy and that activity towards. Yeah. And the other, the other question, well, the other pair we've talked a lot about in the chat room is ideation and futuristic. And those, those blend pretty well together. Do. How do you separate those out? And, and is there one, you know, is there one that's working if, when you think with people and you're working on teams? Is there one, w when do you invoke or how do you use those in ways strategic that, that really bring out both? Yeah, I'd say we start, first of all, let's paint what some, some possible preferred futures can be. We, we start with that futuristic vision. Then what we do is, and, and it's hard for me, I, it, because I have ideation number two, it's hard to separate my futuristic and ideation. They do a lot of dancing together. Um, but I would say that there's ideas of the future, but then it's like now I ideas of how do we get there? And that's probably where my ideation and strategic start coming in is I kind of think first, let's paint the picture in general terms. And now let's get um, some ideas that start drilling that down and getting more specific. I, I can't see your six through 10, but I imagine communications in there somewhere for no, you. No, actually or, it's not. Oh, good. So how have you, because when we think about futuristic and ideation, I hear a lot of the key being in the way we communicate it. How have you with, with, how have you, or what are you using? What themes are you pulling in? Or how do you communicate effectively to make sure people are following you? Because we can have all the greatest ideas in the world. Yes. I've done this sometimes. I've activated. I've started running and I look behind me and nobody's there. You yeah. know, you're like, oh, crap. That's not really, you can't pull people along. So how have you done that when we think about how we communicate the, the vision? And, and for me, that's where you really, uh, I think, again, the, the knowledge of Strengths Finder and the four domains. Um, my two main domains are, um, uh, that that strategic thinking and that relationship building, I look for somebody with the uh, kind of the communication theme uh, in that uh, either that talent theme specifically or or getting people who have that influencing domain. Uh, my son actually has communication number one. And uh, more and more, I have been leveraging him in a lot of stuff that I do from video work, uh, thinking of how creative ways to communicate messages and words just come easy, both uh, verbal and, and uh, visual for him with the work that he does. And so finding people um, I have found in ministry who can help me, okay, we've got this vision. Now, how do we communicate it? How do we uh, inspire people in ways? Because people with those influencing themes and especially communication can take that and they communicate it in ways that you never could have. Uh, that that 
inspire people not just to picture for themselves, but say, I want to be part of that. And so again, that understanding of those domains is is really important, so that uh, you you recognize uh, you need some other people. Uh, I I, t I say that for me, I can envision like a car, but I need people who can help me get the the cars, the, the tires on the car, get that car put together so it can roll out and we can drive it. Uh, and so it's recognizing um, the other people that you need to bring on your team or in your ministry or organization, so that uh, you can be more effective in your leadership. Can we just catch what just happened here? You're, uh, this might be the second of the entire season where we've asked a leader a question about how do you do something and you've instantly gone to, I find a partner. Yeah. And we've been through almost all 34 themes. And I think that that's such a, a testament to what you mentioned earlier about our strengths really becoming perfect performance when we develop them in the relationship with, with another person. Yep. And your tendency was not to say, well, I can bend and flex my themes to be all things to all people. It was to realize you've got sweet spots and other people do too. And yep. it sounds like you've really invested in understanding other people. Yeah. And that's, I think, the value that StrengthsFinder really brings is, is recognizing, hey, I, I know myself. And, and, um, and when you think about uh, in emotional intelligence, uh, it's, it's knowing self and managing self. It's knowing others and managing others. And, and I think that uh, that creating that awareness that strengths finder brings, you know, I know myself, this is the best that I can do, but I also know what I can't do. And I, and I very quickly start saying, who can I develop, help create that awareness in them? And then how do we partner together? I almost want to build on that as a great uh, layer to the question Jim you asked earlier about activator um, and and futuristic of let's define what the problem really is. Is the problem that you're impatient <laughs> and is that getting in the way of anybody else or is that even getting in your way or to bring it back to is the problem that we're actually leaving people in the dust and then what other partners could could help you yeah. if there's people at the you know sort of at the back of the pack because they don't want to they don't want to jump in or, or they don't want to follow who can help them you know and, and what are their options. And maybe it's not something that, that you do. Maybe it's something you leverage others. That's right. Awesome. Tell us about a time, Travis, when, um, when your futuristic has really led you to, to success. I'd say there's a couple times. Um, on a personal level, and this was probably where my uh, futuristic probably came out, uh, one of the most powerful moments was... Um, Years ago, uh, before I went to seminary, I was a director of uh, Christian outreach. And so I had been called to a congregation, uh, West Portal Lutheran in San Francisco. And we're looking at how do we engage and connect with our community. And very early on, I was had these, these visions of, well, we're, we're already the culture was changing. And you could see it definitely in San Francisco before I think it hit, uh, for example, the Midwest, where people weren't coming to church quite as much. Um, there, there was a, a disconnect between churches and the community uh, and even kind of a wariness sometimes of the church. And so one of the things I, I kind of envisioned was, well, why don't if we created a video brochure? And so we brought a video crew in uh, from St. Louis, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Phil Poli, and they came around and they filmed uh, our ministry. And we really created kind of this visual look around our ministry. And immediately I thought, well, let's put this on our website. And this was uh, 1996. And people were laughing at me going, there is no way. That was back in the day of dial-up. Uh, you know, And it would have taken forever for that to have downloaded. This was the day that we didn't even have uh, DVDs yet. This was uh, VHS tapes. <laughs> and I'm already thinking, no, instantly, this should be on the front of our website so people can see it and have a visual look to our ministry before they ever came. And so that's sometimes that futuristic. I mean, we were able to create the video brochure and we created gift baskets and had our VHS, VHS, I'm sorry, I cannot speak, VHS tapes that we put in and left and gave to people. But man, already I could see, we need to have a way that we can let people have an inside look into our ministry. And the internet is a perfect place to be able to do that. Travis, there's been a couple of questions in the chat room about people living in the past. And both when we think about living in the past from an emotional state, you know, the, the things I've done, right? The church deals with this all the time, right? Yes. What the things that I have done. And then think about your the futuristic and being able to provide that hope for, for the future. And without getting too religious uh, on the group here, though, sure, sure, sure. can you talk a little bit about in your ministry and in the church's ministry, using that futuristic to kind of pull people forward or give them that hope, that compassion? Can you talk a little bit about that? How, and kind of how you see that? Yeah, um, I, I, obviously in, in the church setting this happens, but I also think it happens in organizations and, and everyday lives is we have these high moments of our life. 
in which things were great. Um, I, I, forgive me, I, I come from Idaho. So uh, one of our movies is Napoleon Dynamite and it's kind of <laughs> the, the uh, Uncle Rico uh, syndrome that I think we all have. We live in that glory day of, of uh, when we used to be that star football player, the quarterback on the team. And it seems as if we never move beyond that. I actually have seen churches that get stuck in those moments, um, especially I think one of the, the most heartbreaking is, is when you have a school ministry. We, uh, our, our church body, we have a lot of school ministries. I think we're second to the Catholic church uh, in, in private religious uh, schools in, in the U.S. And the, again, part of the economic changes that have happened and, and the cultural changes is a lot of what used to work with these school ministries aren't always working now. And so they relive these glory days and and they don't want to change because they're so invested and there are so many great memories. And I love that. I honor that. I mean, we I think it's always great when you can look back at those glory days and celebrate that. But but it's to to help them to recognize, but where are we today? Let's get an honest look at that. And then we're, from there, where do we want to go to the future? So some of it is having some some honest truth telling that sometimes is a little painful saying we aren't where we used to be, but we can have a hopeful future. We have to anticipate kind of like those waves coming in. How do we catch those waves? What are the changes happening? So we can anticipate and and we can recreate. It's not going to be the same future, but we still can have a positive impact in the lives of each other and the lives of our community. I like, I like the way you started that when you said this also happens in the business world. And we also have collective negativity that begins in the business world. Failures happen, right? We often think of that in the personal sense in the church, people coming in with personal failures. But organizations have failures that are sometimes remembered way longer than they need to be remembered, right? And Or even at an, image, at an individual basis, you might have a team, a coworker, a teammate who had a failure, who gets it, that individual failure gets uh, gets um, remembered by the team. Yeah. When you think about leadership roles, how do you help those teams paint that picture for, for that individual or for the teams themselves? What have you seen? And, and because I think we can apply this to the corporate world as much as we can the church. Yeah. Um, I, I know it might be, seem like a religious thing, but I think it's a human thing. Um, I, I think forgiveness is a huge thing. I think for co-workers to forgive other co-workers. I think um, ability of people to forgive themselves um, when they've made mistakes is such an important thing to be able to even have the hope of a future. Um, I know in coaching, for example, um, I always talk about if we, um, if you're planning a trip and you got too much luggage, sometimes that keeps you from going into that the future of that vacation that you want to go. You can't get on the plane. Sometimes organizations and people carry a lot of baggage with them. And there has to be a place in which you unload that baggage so that you can have the hope of possibly moving into a different future than where you've been or what you're experiencing today. I never thought about that, but it sounds like like there's a big component of forgiveness when you think about hope. Yeah. Uh, and and how much how freeing it is to live in the future because you're it's so much it's like you've moved even even past forgiveness into the place where it's a clean slate already. Yeah, and, and the world of possibilities. Micah, you talked about that in, in the companion guide when we we're thinking yeah. about this. It's not positivity, but it is hope. And that is different, right? And when we think about being able to paint that picture, whether it's in the corporate world, in the church, whatever, of being able to say, the future for you can look a different. Yep. And to be able to to talk about that and say it as a leader, to be able to say it honestly and openly and give that compassion and and really paint a picture. Travis, you just said this, paint that picture. I think that's the power of leadership in these kind of scenarios and for leaders to recognize. And you have connectedness as well, which I, yes. is a superpower that I think really plays into that because you can use ideation to come up with things. You can use futuristic to paint the picture and then connect it yep. together, right, to make it work. I bet you find yourself doing that a lot in your role. Uh, yes, very much, very much. Connecting the past to the future. Um, and I think that's really that's really key in bringing individuals or bringing teams forward to say it doesn't have to be like it is in the past. We can have a new future. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's incredibly powerful. Hmm. Travis, now looking back, so a bit of a, a maybe a reflection question. Sure. <laughs> what do you feel like you've learned about yourself that you hope other leaders with futuristic embrace? 
Well, that's a good question. Well, you always know in coaching a, a good question that you have to pause and think for a second. <laughs> Rephrase the question one more time for me. Yeah, what have you learned about yourself that you hope other leaders with Futuristic also learn or embrace? I would say the, 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 the greatest of that is your power to paint that picture for the future, to give hope to people, to, to think of a, a, a preferred future that's different from maybe where you've been or where you're experiencing. Um, but not to get too far ahead, which very early on uh, in, in my ministry, uh, I, I did. And uh, that was something that I really had to temper in, in my back. It's kind of like um, sometimes our strengths are like these wild horses and they're untamed and they just want to run. Sometimes my futuristic would take me so far ahead and, you know, again, you look back and, and you just don't see anybody with you. It's, it's recognizing it's a powerful horse, but it needs to be tamed and need to be harnessed. And it's not just for your benefit, but it's the benefit of those that you lead. It's the benefit of your ministry or your organization and learning um, to bring it from that, that basement to that balcony, that it's not self-serving, but that it's other serving. Uh, that I think is the maturity of leadership for me that has been where I'm not just using it for my own visions, my own future, my own ideas, but I'm using it for the sake of those that I serve. And it's it's what we can create together and it's where we can go together that I think um, becomes really uh, something that's powerful that serves others. That's beautiful. Thanks. You know, I think what I've learned from you so far today is just the, that deep appreciation for every theme and, and realizing the value that that everybody brings. I've been sort of watching our chat feature and it seems like there's this connotation instantly when people, and they even put it in air quotes, they'll say uh, stuck in the past or, or sort of backwards thinking and it's immediately somehow bad. Yeah, <laughs> it those barrier like, labels that we put. Yeah, what, what about saying, gosh, yeah, I'm in the past and there's great things here. Or, hey, I, I'm in the future and I've learned a lot from the future. Um, sort of just, just trans, I think it's, it really is a, a strengths-based a, a transition for in our relationships and in our expectations of how do you, how do you start from a place of potential and a place of hope? Yeah. Um, well, and, and with that past, I think where futuristic and, and context can come together is to have a future that's not disconnected from the past. We can take some of the best of who we are and what's done. Yeah. It's just translating it in a new way for a new future that can be created. Right. They're not opposite themes, are yeah. they? I mean, I, I've coached people who have both of them. It's it's just where do you where do you spend your brain? And yep. that could be very, very connected. Uh, excellent. Travis, Travis one, I, one, one more question. Hold on. One more question. Sure, absolutely. Go, Micah, uh, and I know we're, we're running short on time, but there's Richard asked this great question about forgiveness. And we were talking about earlier. And how do you know that that's taking effect in an organization, right? How do you know? And, and I'm going to say w we see a performance change. Right. If you want, if you want an indication that forgiveness is happening, that people have forgiven themselves, or teams have forgiven themselves, or we're getting beyond failure, I think we see a performance in, in, increase. Right. There, yeah. there, they, there's freedom. They're, they're happier. They're more productive. I mean, that's the way I would say it, Travis. In your experience, as people are experiencing that, our teams are experiencing, what kind of things can we look for to know it's happening? I think the thing is, you know, with forgiveness. You know, we always say God can forget, but people, we always still remember. The thing is, is do we continue to dwell there? And does it hold us captive? Um, when you know that forgiveness is taking hold in an individual and organizations and teams is when, yes, it still may be there, but it's not holding us captive anymore. We're not dwelling there uh, on the mistakes any longer. But now there is the opportunity of what can be, uh, that we're free. I think freedom is a big thing. And I think that the, the thing to realize that mistakes can also become the best opportunities for growth and lessons. Um, that uh, we aren't the people who we are if it wasn't for the mistakes we've made. And it's the ability to learn from that and to then turn it into something that actually becomes a positive and, and we grow in wisdom and experience from that, that we can become better and our organizations can become better. Yeah, I think some people think that that term, that idea is owned or can only be in the church and I or, or whatever. And I think you, you said this earlier, I think that's a human thing. Oh yeah, and marriage. It, it, Marriages it, it, don't succeed if there's not forgiveness. No. Friendships don't succeed. Teams, uh, if yeah. there's not forgiveness, 
Um, it, it's hard for any human beings because those mistakes can separate and it's only forgiveness that, that reunites us again. Yeah, no, and I think it can be a universal concept that could and should be used as we think about our leadership. I don't think as leaders, if we understand that concept, if we're not able to see that hope and forgiveness happen, um, our teams will be damaged, and and I don't and I don't think they will be as productive and as engaged as they can be if the, those kinds of principles aren't happening. And that's the only thing that will give you a hope for the future. Right? No, right on. It's very tied to futuristic. You know, people are saying, Jim, why are you talking about this? Because I think it's a very key component because we have to have a hope for the future, and that hope sometimes has to be healed by forgiveness. So that's I think right. it's just a, a really important part. Mike, I don't want to sound too preachy, so we should wrap this up. I was just going to thank Travis for never, never making it obvious, but making it so I instrumental that this is pervasive in all aspects of our life. Your your initial um, imagery about you know blending together three primary colors uh, was really helpful, but what you did so brilliantly that is evident of the way that you live and the way that you lead is it was it, it, all of your takes on strengths are all about the the personal, the professional, and and you're even bold enough to bring in uh, some faith and some spirituality to it. So I think that's something that we can all think a little bit more about if this isn't a church thing, this isn't a leadership thing, this is a human thing. Yeah. Um, so thanks for, um, thanks for the work that you're doing that way. I think about the, uh, the purposefulness that you're focusing on coaching your family, but also letting it just sort of spill over into how you approach humans. So thanks for, thanks for demonstrating that. And thanks for being a great poster child for futuristic. Oh, well, thank you. My pleasure. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to share today. Travis, when I first met you, uh, I, I, I and I watched you on Facebook, uh, and your you have taken this futuristic approach to your own life in investing in yourself, in education, in training, in a lot of questions, in being present. You spent the summer on a sabbatical, learning, and we, we were talking about this in the pre-show. You know, you said you felt a little isolated because you were, you know, spending so much time with yourself and learning. I said I get about two hours of that, and I am done. <laughs> Travis, we certainly see your futuristic, or I see that through getting to know you and how you're investing in your own future. Uh, you take that very, very seriously and see a future for yourself um, as well. So thank you for joining us today yeah, and thank you. appreciate all that you do. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available at the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com. Send us your questions or comments if you like to be guest blogger. We do the blogs on fire. I know I say that all the time. But it really to, is. <laughs> it really is right now. It's it's moving quite nicely. And you might have something locked up inside your head that you want to write out to us and get to us. We will consider it for the blog. Send that to us, coaching at gallup.com. Put guest blogger in the subject line. That will make its way to Micah. And we can consider it for our blog. The blog is really the center of everything we do from a coaching uh, standpoint. And the resources page, newly redesigned resources page, is the place to be. Head out to coaching.gallup.com and click on the resources tab, easiest way Get there. If you're interested in becoming a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, we talked a little bit about that during the program. All the courses that lead to certification are listed on our courses site. Really easy to remember, just courses.gallup.com. And if you have any questions, there is a contact form right there on the page. If you found this helpful, we'd ask that you share And Why wouldn't you? We'd love to have you come back here next Thursday or listen via podcast. We love it when you come out and join us live, though. And with that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. <laughs>